How's everybody doing this morning? Amen, amen. Thank you. Praise from the front seat. Hey, how's everybody doing today? Hey, uh, thank you guys for coming in on such a cold day. My name is Carlos. I'm the senior leader here here at the Kingdom. So happy to have each and every one of you if you're online watching uh, in your closet because you don't want your... Um, your friends to hear you watching what's about to be spoken. Welcome again. We have some visitors in the house. My boy Mike here, uh, bartender, mixologist extraordinaire. Go see him anytime between 10 and 5, Monday through Friday. He'll fix you up a good cocktail and get you some good lunch. Amen. At Burdock and Bitters at the Marriott. Yeah, yeah. We got some uh, visitors in the back too. Some of my friends over there. JMO, all my friends. Nice. Thank you for coming in. Um, yeah, guys, so, uh, man, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here again in the cold weather. You know, I'm from Texas, so this is pretty foreign to me, although it still is exciting, you know. Um, anybody here love the cold weather? Yeah. Woo! Man, and, and most of you guys have been here all your life. That's hilarious. Yeah, you know, I come from Texas, a land where it's not as cold, praise God. But, yeah, my name is Carlos, and, um, yeah, man, I'm so glad you're here today because we're going to just carry on a conversation. Um, if you were uh, here last week or maybe you weren't, make sure you go to our YouTube channel and check out the sermon I did last week called You Are Here. Somebody say, You Are Here. You are here. You know, um, I think we got to start making the distinction in the church that Jesus didn't save you from a pissed off God. He saved you from sin, and there's a big difference, you know, and if we don't put the big rock in first, well, then we're always coming with the sense of inferiority between you and a God that really wants to love you. You know, um, I remember growing up in the church, I grew up in the Catholic church, and maybe you heard something like this, but the, the Jesus I came to was a Jesus that was kind of like this. It was a story like, Carlos, you're a wretched sinner. And God can't stand the sight of you. But if you just um, got baptized and had your first communion or maybe said a prayer or whatever that is in the denomination you came from, then you'd be a little bit more tolerable. But nonetheless, he'd still be looking over your shoulder, waiting for you to mess up. And at any given moment, he would drop the hammer on you and strike you down. Does that sound familiar to the gospel we've heard? Yeah, so I heard that and I was born into that. And then when I was born into that, I got saved, um, but God didn't like me anymore. You know, and uh, any more, any less in the day I didn't. He was just, okay, Carlos, you're on our side. You're technically saved. But still, I'm going to have it out for you. So this is what I want you to do, and this is what was told to me. So when you sin, you're going to go and confess your sin. And then you're going to go and confess your sin and feel good for a little while. And then you're even going to have a sincere heart and try not to sin the next day, but you're going to go ahead and do it anyway. And then you're going to have to come back to church and, and, and confess it again and over and over. And for the rest of your life, you're going to be in this rigmarole of, Messing up, confessing, trying harder, messing up, going to church, confessing, and going the same way for the next 80 years of your life. And hopefully, the day you die, the one before you die, you're going to have an opportunity to confess one more time. Because if you have any dirty, rotten sin on your soul, before you, your eyes shut and you die, guess where you're going to go? to hell, right? Yeah, anybody ever heard that, right? And then, you know what, I mean, and the thing is, too, it's like some people are actually good at that. Some people are have a good self-discipline, well-powered, devotional life that, that causes them not to sin, and they do confess. And I'm not against confession, because you have a father who he understands, and as a father-son-daughter relationship, he wants to help you through those things and show you who you really are, so you wouldn't have a lot to confess anymore, and that's how the gospel goes. But, you know, there is some guy in um, Wichita, Kansas somewhere, and his name's Ted. And Ted, ever since he got born again or got saved, he's never sinned. And uh, man, he's uh, living a holy life, and he's in a life of exclusion from the world. He lives in a barn where he does like woodworking every day, and he prays to God at night, and he worships in the morning. And um, have you ever heard of this guy named Ted? I'm sure you have, but the problem is no one's ever seen this dude. And Christianity has, has, uh, has built this construct of a perfect guy actually doing the works for righteousness to be saved. And if you could do it, you and probably Ted would be the only ones in heaven, right? But the thing is, you can't. And what you come to find out is that Ted one day, while nobody was looking, the back of his barn in 1982 stepped on the dog too hard and sinned. And he forgot to confess it. So even when we get to heaven in that paradigm, he's not going to be there anyway. So all that to say this, that dead religion is terrible. And what makes dead religion terrible is that it requires a 100% score. 
Religion requires that you perform the magnitude to 100%, and that's the only way it's interested in you. And how many know that's not you? So religion's not interested in you. It's interested in someone who can. That was Jesus, right? So Jesus, the good news is not that God, Jesus came to shield you from an from a intolerable kind of a teenage, you know, teenage version of God who is good one day and hormonal the next day and decided to strike you down. He came to save you from sin. And in that paradigm, in that thing, not only did he save you from sin, which is amazing, not only has he forgiven you, but he's also included you in this dance. Somebody say dance. Dance, dance, dance right? So that's where the story begins. And a lot of our theologies, a lot of our born-again experiences starts with you being a sinner and God saving you. And yes, you're technically saved, but it really benefits you nothing here. And, but you know what? Congratulations, by the way. You'll have an eternal home in heaven when you die. But between now and then, hey, just pray to me. Maybe I'll help you out. I'm still distant. I'm still delayed. And I really don't know what to do with you until you die. Anybody ever heard that, right? Cool. Me too. <laughs> so I want to talk about this today too because um, I wrote this on Facebook the other day and I got a lot of great likes and great not likes. No, what they, thumbs downs, I guess. But I put this, um, and I still believe it's true today, but it says this. It says, in church, we hear a lot about our forgiveness. Have you, have you been heard that you are forgiven of your sin? Right? Yeah. And is that true? Absolutely. But I put very little about this. We've heard a lot about forgiveness, but very little about the staggering reality of our inclusion in Jesus' relationship with his father and his son. In the spirit. It's not, a, it's not an accident that the New Testament refers to the spirit of truth as the same spirit of adoption. There's a dance like no other where romance overwhelms us in the auditorium of our hearts. You see, um, I started off last week. It's called You Are Here because a lot of the church knows that they're saved. If I stood up in any church and said, hey, are you saved? 95% of the people would say, yes, I am. And if I asked them, what do you save from? People would say sin, death, sickness, all these different things. Absolutely true. But if I asked them, what do you save to? It goes quiet in the room. You see, in Jesus' redemption on the cross did a lot more than just giving you a permanent place in heaven, but actually what happened is heaven came inside of you. And that's the news. The good news is that without your, without your confession, Jesus Christ came, and now your confession aligned with his purpose and his conclusion is what gives you everlasting life now. You know, I see Jesus in scripture walking around, and he um, talks about heaven and hell, but he only really talks about it in a context where people are postponing it. Like, he comes to some people, and people say, hey, well, tell us about the resurrection. He goes, I'm trying to tell you about eternal life right now you can have because I'm in front of you, but if you really want to postpone what I'm having you now, it's going to be the gnashing of teeth. Forget the postponed, delayed entry gates to the pearly gates of heaven to have joy. I can give it to you now. And if you don't believe me, if you don't see what I see, if you don't see what I've come to redeem, if you don't see what you're redeemed to, it's going to be hell, the wailing, and the gnashing of teeth here. Forget in heaven or hell. I come to bring heaven here. So Jesus makes this amazing declaration when he comes to the scene. He says, repent for the kingdom is here. I sound like I'm in an auditorium. Cool. So I want to talk to you today about the narrow gate or the narrow way. Anybody ever heard that parable? Right. Man, the gate is, man, the gate's narrow. It should scare the crap out of a lot of people. It scared the crap out of me when I was six in church. Well, Carlos, the gate is narrow and very few people find it. But wide is the way to destruction. You ever heard that? Do you live like that? Do you think that, man, by what I do or what I don't do, do I fit the stature of being in the narrow way or do I, am I on the way to destruction even if I think I'm right? And what do I do with that? So I want to talk to you today about the narrow way to the dance. Because long before anybody was created or anything, there was a dance. You see, um, when you ask people, hey, uh, when did this whole Christianity thing begin? And people say, well, in Genesis 3. Or in Genesis 1, I'm sorry, you know, God created the heavens and the earth. But how many know that in, and that's true, he created the heavens and the earth in Genesis 1.1, but John says this in his gospel account that in the beginning was the word, 
And that word wasn't the Bible because the Bible wasn't there. He was meaning Jesus, the logos, the logic of God. So he was saying before anything was created, there was a natural relationship. There was a natural fellowship. It was Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And because there was more than one, there was called fellowship. You see, a lot of the way we prize God is in solidarity, in isolation. But how many know God didn't create Jesus and he didn't create the Holy Spirit? They've been eternal from the foundation, before the foundation the earth that have coincided in the authentic idea of what relationship and fellowship is. So when you become born again, you get baptized, or you say that prayer to get you into heaven, not only you say from your sin, but you're put in the middle of that fellowship, what I like to call a dance. And how many of you guys like to dance? Why? Because there's romance, right? So before anything was created, it was a father and the son and the spirit. And they were having this cosmic dance, man, where they were just dancing and there was other giving love and fellowship and support and, and, and authenticity and love and peace and righteousness and joy. And they're enveloping each other in this never-ending dance. And like, oh, my God, I got to create something. I got it. Let's create man and and woman in my image and include them in said dance and share it. Exactly what we experience there, we want them to experience the same joy, the same peace, the same innocence, the same faith, the same baila, the same cumbia, the same dance that they did. So the good news is today that if you're born again, if you know you're a Christian, if you know you've received the forgiveness of God, you are now in a bigger paradigm than just living forgiven and trying to figure it out the rest of your life. You are in this dance. And when you're in this dance, you experience the fullness of joy no matter what God throws at you. So I want to talk about that today in the narrow way. And before I just start there, um, this offends a lot of religious people, but Jesus loves to party. Jesus loves to party. A lot of his parables are about the son coming home to a party. That he's throwing a party and the religious people don't come, so he gets people out of the streets to come. It's about a banquet. It's about a feast. So I want to talk to you today, not just about the narrow way just to get into heaven and live here on earth, separated, untol barely tolerated by God, but a narrow way to where you are, which is that dance, which is the Trinity, which is what they're celebrating. Because you were redeemed a lot just from a lot more from the forgiveness of sin, but to that dance. So let's talk about that today. So let's go to the next screen. And this, um, we've done a lot of bad in this verse because we've read it out of context, you know. And um, this starts in Matthew chapter 7. But I like Matthew. He's one of my favorite um, gospel writers because he's writing specifically to the Jews. And the Jews at this point have been under the law for 1,300 years. And the law is this weight of demands saying, you must do this, and you must do that, and you must do this, and you must do that. 623 laws and commandments that they had to fulfill in order to get right with God. You know, so he shows, Jesus shows up on the infrastructure. And where did Jesus come from? The dance, the Trinity, right? And Jesus didn't show up in the world to a religious infrastructure who's trying to do the good things to make God like them because they were doing a good job at it. See, Jesus didn't show up to the world because they had awesome worship events and he just wanted to add a little bit to their broken religion. See, he didn't come to... He didn't come just to fix a religion. He came to restore a relationship. So Jesus encounters these people for 1,300 years. They've been trying to get it right. And some of them are doing really good. But when it comes down to it, he's, he's telling these people that that way of thinking is the wide gate. And the wide gate leads to destruction. So what Jesus comes to say is that there's a party. But the party I'm trying to invite you to, you can't bring your party. So let's party. So let's just pick it up right here. And what you see right before this, and like I said, Matthew is one of my favorite authors because he's writing to the religion in me. He's writing to the religion in you. And when I, when I, when I talk about religion, it's man's attempt to set himself right with God through his behavior. And the thing is, nobody could do that. So Jesus had to come on your behalf and fulfill that obligation so now you can have compatibility and love and peace with the Father. So in Matthew chapter 1, um, just real quick, building up to this Sermon on the Mount, you see uh, 
Matthew writing, and he, the first thing he does is characterize in Matthew chapter 1 is the genealogy. And the genealogy is a Jewish tradition about how he came from the seed of da or Abraham all the way to David, to Bathsheba, and all these different lineages that Jesus came. Why? Because he's trying to prove to the Jewish people, to the religious folks, that this guy Jesus is who he says he is. Do the math. Look at the, the family line. It's him, right? And then in, in chapter 2, Jesus, like Israel, he... um. He went down into Egypt, right? We see in the, in, in, in the Old Testament, they come, uh, they're in slavery 430 years, and they get delivered, but Jesus liked them. He goes into Egypt because when he's born, they want to kill every firstborn, so Jesus goes into Egypt. And then you see in chapter 3, he's brought up through the waters as the Israelites pass through the Red Sea. Jesus is baptized in the Jordan River, and then in chapter 4, he goes into the wilderness just like the, that, just like the Israelites did. And then chapter 5, Six and seven, which we'll be reading out today, is called the Sermon on the Mount. And in five, six, and seven, Jesus, like the Israelites, explained the law. You see, a lot of people will read this, and we'll get to it right now, and they say, these are things I got to do in order to get saved. But Jesus is just simply reintroducing the implications and the burden that the law puts on you so that you give up and put faith in him. Do you understand? So here we go. We come through this, and this is the Sermon on the Mount, and this is Jesus' first preach, pretty much. And up to this point, from uh, Matthew chapter 5 to 7, you know, he's not the great preacher we're looking for. Jesus is not preaching grace from Matthew 5 to 7. He's preaching the law on steroids. You know, and he says things like, hey, um, have you ever uh, committed adultery? And he says, well, if you've even looked at that website, you've already done it in your heart. You know, and then he says, hey, have you ever um, killed anybody? No. He's like, well, if you're even angry and you flick off somebody in traffic, you're already guilty. And Jesus, which seems to be an impossible thing for people to do or impossible, he raises the standard and says, you think it's up here. As long as you've never killed anybody, you're good. But I say that it's a heart issue. And if you're angry in your heart, you're guilty. So Jesus is here trying to show them that the law that they put so much faith in for 1,300 years is unable to be accomplished in your work. And then he says something towards Matthew chapter 7. Hey, come to me if you're under that teaching. I'll give you rest from that. So Jesus is the peace, and this is what he's offering. So let's pick up the story here in, um, in, in uh, Matthew chapter 7. It's called the narrow way. Narrow way, I'm sorry. And it says this in verse 13. Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Beware of the false prophets who came to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. So Jesus shows up to these people who have been beaten up by the law, but still trying to use it to show God how faithful, how obedient they are. And the law just exposes that, no, you're not there yet. You're not there yet. And they live under this cycle of guilt, shame, and condemnation. And he comes in with a new message. And remember, Jesus doesn't take a pit stop at Bucky's in Houston, Texas before he hits there. He comes straight from the dance, straight from this joy, straight from this peace, straight from authentic life, relationship, and lands at these people and says, you guys are doing it all wrong. There's a different way. There's a narrow or gate, right? So when you look at this, he says, enter by the narrow gate, which is for wide is the gate and broad is the way which leads to destruction. And there are many who go by it. So what he's saying is that the law and the Sermon on the Mount, everything he's saying is not the means of the narrow way. See, the Sermon on the Mount, what he tells you to do and blessed are this, this, and this, he's not telling you that this is a narrow way. He's saying there is a narrow way and it's a person. It's me. And if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, if you want to understand this dance, you don't have to go by your performance, but go by my performance. That's why we can have rest. That's why we can have the fullness of life. And then he's addressing people in verse 15. He said, beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. And he's saying all the people who are trying to tell you do better better to earn God's favor, pray harder, do more worship services to call God closer. Those are the people who are in sheep's clothing trying to get you back in the broad way. You see, a lot of our prayer efforts, a lot of our devotion, a lot of our, our Bible time in the morning is part of the broad way that leads to destruction still. See, because Jesus fulfilled something for you and as you so you can experience him as the narrow way. You understand? Awesome, next one. 
sweet. So here we go. Here's a couple of people who, um, in, in the Bible, there's a bunch of people who like the, who like the, the wide way. They like the, the, the wide way. And here's one of them. And this, we read this. This is a rich young ruler. Anybody ever heard that story, right? Yeah, so I just want to read it out real quick in, in my Bible because it's awesome in my Bible. And he says this. Oh, where are we? I'm sorry. All righty, where are we? Okay, he says, so Jesus counsels the young ruler, the rich young ruler, right? And it says this, now behold, one came to him and said, good teacher, what good shall I do that I may have eternal life? So, and Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commands. And he said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. So Jesus is, comes up to this guy, and this guy who... Um, He's come to Jesus not because he's exhausted, but because he's probably heard that Jesus has done good works. And he comes to J Jesus and wants to go do good works. And he says this. He says, Jesus, what must I do to have this thing called eternal life? And Jesus looks at him and says, well, if it's based on what you can do to have eternal life, if it's based on your effort, your obedience, your prayer services, your re actually repentance, well, then this is what you got to do. Keep all the commandments. You got to keep all the commandments. If you want to be righteous, if you want to get into heaven by the broad gate, you got to keep all the commandments. And James 2.10 says that if you've broken one of them, you're guilty in all of them. So, so Jesus adopts an infrastructure of the law and gives it to disqualify everyone, but only so that he could qualify you in him. And everlasting life is seen whether you're able to partake, engage, and accept that invitation into the dance. So he says, now behold, one came to him, good teacher, what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus goes, oh, what must you do? It's not about what you can do, it's about what I can do. But if now that we're on the conversation, and it's about what you can do and what you can bring to the dance, and you want to bring your own piñata to this party, and you want to bring your own food, this is what you got to do. You better bring everything perfect. And we can't. And it says this, he said to him, well, which ones? And he said, you shall not murder. And he gives him the Ten Commandments. Next one. And then he goes on to the, to the story. And the young man said to him, all of these things I have kept from my youth. What still do I lack? What's the main thing that this guy is coming at with? What must I do? What must I do, Jesus? What can I do to have eternal life? And Jesus goes, man, if it's based on your work, you better follow it the commandments and you better be perfect and Jesus said to him if you, want to, if you want to be perfect go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me but when the young man had heard him saying that he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions you see this guy didn't want the narrow way he just wanted a less broad way <laughs> See, this guy wasn't interested in giving up everything to follow Jesus. He was interested in Jesus just meeting him where he's at and narrowing the way just a little bit, which was still broad, that will lead to the way to destruction. So, so in, in this stories, what you're seeing is that the one thing that robs you from this dance is your own ability to try to perform to get into it. You see, Jesus gave you the wedding dress. He gave you the nice dress to wear to the dance, even if you're hairy-legged. He gave this to you and invited you, punched your ticket, and now you're in. And the worst thing you can do is sit outside and say, oh, man, I want to bring my own dress. I'm not pretty enough. I need to butter myself up more. But what he's saying is you can't bring your party to my party. You can't dance in those clothes until you put on the robe I've given you of righteousness, and then you can enjoy the dance, right? So he went away sorrowful for he had... Many possessions. You know, we, we, say, we always teach this verse about you better not be rich and you better drive a 1993 Cavalier and that's it. And you better not get the leather seats because if you have a lot of possessions, you're not going to get into heaven. And the subject of this verse is not possessions. It's you believing you can do anything to have this salvation. All these things I have kept from my youth. What still do I lack, Jesus? The very next verse. And he tells him. Next one. 
And then in verse 23, reading on, he says this, Then Jesus said to his disciples, As surely I say to you, that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. You better not be rich. You better give everything to the poor, because if you, if you don't give everything, you can't get into heaven. That's what we've said about this. And again, I say it's easier, it is easy for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. So what makes this man rich in the story? It was his works. It was his righteousness. It was his ability to follow commands. It was his ability to be his own savior. And he says that paradigm does not fit in this narrow way. And the narrow way is so narrow because it goes to a person. And it's me and it goes through my righteousness, my obedience, my repentance, my confession, my death for you and as you. So if you bring anything to there, you're not going to fit. And you're going to be on the broad way that leads to destruction. Not to mention... The temple falls in 70 AD. And you know how many Christians were dead at the collapse of the temple? Zero. Why? Because they fled and left. There was a lot of Jews that got killed. So what he's saying is that if you believe me, when you see all this going down, all this thunderous war, when the, when the temple's going to be falling down, if you don't believe me, you're going to be stuck in here praying, and that broad way is going to lead you to destruction. And it doesn't just mean to hell. It means you're going to die. In John 3, 16, he says... He says, uh, for I have come, uh, he says, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he, that he gave his only son, and whoever believed in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Yes, he was talking about heaven, but he was talking about life here. He says, if you don't believe in the son, you're going to be in the demolishing of this temple. And you're going to be one of those thousands of Jews that die in here. So yes, it's for the future. And yes, you can have everlasting life in heaven. But what he's saying is, if you want to enjoy everlasting life now, it's through a narrow gate. And it's through me. And if you abide in me, I will abide in you. And when that thing comes and the bell crumbles and not one stone will be left on another stone in the temple of Jerusalem, you won't be there to see it. You will be alive. Wow. Wow. So when his disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, well, then who can be saved? This guy is rich. He's richer than everybody. Jesus, this guy could bankroll our ministry. We can preach the gospel. He can go sell his Rolls Royce, and we can get better microphones. And you won't be able to just preach on a, on a hill anymore, but you'll be in a big church, wooing everybody. And he says, but if that guy can't buy it, well, then who can get in? And Jesus says this. With man, it's impossible. With man, it's impossible, salvation. Yeah. But with God, all things are possible. Yeah. You see, in 1 Corinthians chapter, I think, 13, it says this. It says, it is by his doing that you are in Christ. It's by God's doing that you're in Christ, who became to us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. You see, there is a narrow way. But the narrow way isn't narrow because it's hard to find and it's hidden. It's narrow because it's hard to accept that you have to lay down all of your efforts for salvation and put trust in Jesus. Isn't that amazing? Wow. So what can I do to be saved? I've checked the done. I've done all those things, Jesus. And when the disciples saw that that guy couldn't even get into heaven after all the works he's done, after all the prayer conferences he's hosted, out of all the sick he's healed, out of all these different things, like, dude, if that guy can't in, well, then how can it happen? He goes, with man, it's impossible. <laughs> with you, if the subject of your life is how I can do this, how I can do that, how I can do this, instead of we, you and Jesus together, well, then you're going to live a life of destruction. It doesn't mean that he's going to strike you down in the parking lot after you leave. It just means that you're going to live disengaged from his heart and you're going to incur this self-inflicted wound Next. So this is the good news. And this is why it's hard to find because the dance is for certified losers. It's for the people who can't come contribute to anything. You see, in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. What that translates to nowadays is, blessed are the people who just come to my party and they have nothing else to contribute. I'll prepare the dinner table. I'll fatten the calf. I'll prepare the table. I'll prepare the dance. Just come and sit freely. No, Jesus, but I planted a church in 2022 and we grew. 
And we're 1,500 people, and we had five different churches and 100 different missionary things. That's great, but it's not based on that. You did that because I loved you, not because you tried to love me. See, a lot of people adopt Christianity as a way of trying to love God. Dude, you will crush yourself trying to love God, man. And you're going to wind up despaired, lonely, hopeless, and frustrated that it didn't work. And the good news is that for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. You see, the only capacity you have in your life to love God with all your heart, mind, body, soul, and strength is to let him love you first. It's to sit at the table of grace, the, the dance, can just be so consumed with the dance that the byproduct will be that you love him by byproduct. So the dance is for certified losers. Jesus went to the people that couldn't contribute anything. He went to the tax collectors. He went to the sinners who had no record of righteousness. They weren't trying to keep the laws. They were out there partying. And he went to these people and said, good, you don't have that religion of trying to please me. But guess what? I'm going to look at you in your eyes at that bar while you're intoxicated. And you're going to see the real you in me. And you're not going to want that high anymore because you see another one. And now, instead of being a drunkard, you're going to be able to go to the bar, enjoy a couple, and still not ruin your identity or your family. The dance is for certified losers. Those who have nothing to contribute, but they come anyway. You know, there's a lot of parables about how Jesus, he uh, says to this one guy, go create a party for me and invite all the guest lists, all the religious people. And they're too busy. They're too busy putting it on their own party. They're too busy doing their own things. Their, their dance is way too important. And nobody shows up. And he says, you know what, just go invite everybody on the streets in. Go invite the people who can't celebrate their own good works. Go celebrate the people that are too despair to say, look at what I've done. And invite them to the party. <laughs> you see, the dance is for losers. But there's winners trying to get in right now, especially in church. And they're bringing your track rec record to show you. But it's those, blessed is the poor in spirit. Those who, who know they can't do this by themselves. For theirs is the kingdom of God. Man, next. You guys all right? <laughs> it's wonky. Another guy who, um, who wanted just a less broad way was um, these Pharisees. You see, in, in Matthew chapter 7, right after this, he gets into another story. And we've all heard this, and Jesus says... Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall you enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does my will, the will of my Father in heaven. He says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, have done many wonders in your name, and I will declare to them, Jesus says, and then I'm going to tell them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity, those of you who practice lawlessness. See, these people have come with a lot of good report cards. I behaved for two weeks, Jesus. I planted churches. I did this thing. I did all these things for you because I love you, Jesus. And I did this thing. And I casted out demons in your name. And I prophesied. And I had a prophetic conference. And I had a healing meeting. And I did all these things. I saw your wonders work. And Jesus is going to say to him, I don't know you. Because it's all about what you've done. I've done this, Jesus. Look at my report card. Jesus says, if you come with your report card, you're left empty. That is the broad way that leads to destruction. It's about my report card that counts. And you get into the kingdom not based on your works, but on my work. Oh my gosh. It's not about you shouldn't heal the sick or you shouldn't prophesy. It's about you coming to him based on your standard of living. See, Jesus hates self-righteousness. And the devil loves because you're so valuable and he knows the dance in the Trinity that he can't have any part of. So he tries to keep you apart from there by making the work yours. Right. Therefore, I never knew you. I never danced with you. You were a servant doing the chairs, doing all these things, putting up the banners, which I'm super grateful for, but you never danced with me. You never partied with me. You never sat there and looked into my eyes and had a real conversation with me. You've been busy trying to do things for me instead of doing them with me and being with me. 
Broad is the way that leads to destruction. You can be busy putting up chairs every day in church and forget to dine with him. And when you dine with him, even before putting up chairs, you'll want to serve. And you'll do it out of a relationship instead of distance, delay, and separation. Does this make sense? Yes. My gosh. They're going to come to me. I did all these things, Jesus. Can I get into heaven? And he said, I don't know you, man. I don't understand this I, 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 I. Your I and your doing cannot get you to where I can provide, my friend. Therefore, whoever hears me saying, the sayings of mine, and does them, I will liken to a wise man who built on rock. You see, there's a lot of counterfeits for the narrow way. And it looks like busyness. It looks like church attendance sometimes. It looks like church volunteering. All those things are great. We need those things. But that's still the broad way that leads to destruction. See, if you don't have the big rock in first, you're peddling of small ones and building on sand. That's just going to crumble. And you'll leave this church because I haven't preached you happy. Or you'll leave this church because I haven't called your name to give too many testimonies. And it's not about that. It's about his testimony that he's trying to say. Next. Next. See, religion demands a perfect score. The sad part is that if you come, even after you died, and approach God with all your scorekeeping and all your judicial balances and everything you did right and how many times you did this and how many times you did that, he's going to compare it to the work of Jesus. (laughs) You understand that? If you come based on your righteousness, you compete with Jesus' righteousness. You see, in the whole subscript of the Sermon on the Mount is this. You'll find where he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and the rest will be added to you. And then he says something like, um, he's like, keep the eye single because if the uh, the body, the eye is flooded with light, so will the body be. And he uses this vision language, this lens language, and he came to an infrastructure that was so busy trying to please him that he said, change your lens. Change the way you're thinking. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Why? Because the kingdom was the first thing given away with Adam. You see, Adam had this trinity, this dance, this exploration of the trinity, and they loved it, and they loved it, and they were part of this dance, and then they're lied to, and they're put outside of it, and now they got to create their own dance, which is the broad way that leads to destruction. And as the first Adam lost the first dance, Jesus has come to invite you to the real one. See, real freedom comes from understanding that Jesus has forgiven all of your dead works. Understand this. Jesus has forgiven all of your dead works. The good ones and the bad ones. You're not writing on good dead works. There's a difference between good works and dead works. And all the dead works, even if you packed up a church, he's forgiven you that too. Because narrow is the way. Narrow is the gate. That has a counterfeit. It looks good. And I know you have a sincere heart. I know you love Jesus. But if you enter through any other way, you have been deceived. And this isn't a warning to keep you out. This is a grace invitation that you get to come in as a loser. You see, grace is for losers. Because winners don't need it. Next. You see, but like 1,300 years of trying to please God and do the right things and keep score, the worst thing it does is it creates you to be the legend in your mind. You know you're religious if you're depending on yourself to be the legend, to be the hero of the story. When he is, Us being a legend in our own minds allows us to create a world where we have to match a grade that we can't. And the byproduct is that we spend a lot of time, a lot of resource, a lot of energy getting identity from being that legend that we projected on our husbands, our wives, our children, and our community. And because we ultimately know we can't fulfill this thing, and it's torture trying, we invite people to join the race with us Just so we can have something to talk about. Just so we can have drama. 
and a saga. And what you're doing is by believing that you're not introducing him to the party, the dance. What you're doing is you're creating your own dance that nobody really likes. You don't really like it. You don't like your vestments. You don't like the music. And you're telling everybody, it's so fun. Come on in. And they come in and they pretend with you, but it's lame. And you tell them that Jesus is great. And he's the best DJ. And man, he's really dressed me up. And they don't believe you. Jesus didn't come to promote the legend in you. He came to kill it. <laughs> what can I do? But didn't I do this, Jesus? Didn't I do that? And I followed the commandments? Yeah. Get away from me, you worker of iniquity. You know what that means? It means that your works are not valued. <laughs> you... Man of lawlessness, you following the wrong law. You're following it according to the letter instead of the spirit. Man, we ruin society by being the legend in our own minds and telling people to do the same. That's good. That's good. Wow. We reconcile nobody to a good God like that. Wow. We end up reconciling people to a judge instead of a father. And we put the legal demands for them to accomplish as if we could ever. And what you're giving people is bad news. <laughs> Not good news. The good news is that all the work that you should have done for salvation, Jesus rolled up his sleeves and accomplished it single-handedly for you. And now you don't got to bicker with God and fill out a questionnaire and a survey of how much you did. You just say, hey, you know what? Um, Jesus filled that for me. And, and now, God, I have the same relationship Jesus did because I put faith in his work and neglected mine. And I guarantee you in that space, you do more good works by accident than you would trying to please God. Next. But this legend that we're talking about, <laughs> it's not exclusive with you or for you. It started in the garden. Somebody say the garden. the garden. I don't think we preach the garden enough. Because you can't really understand what you've been redeemed from and so you can understand what was lost on your behalf. So it says this, um, they're created in his image, right? And God tells them to be fruitful, multiply, name everything, and, and, and subdue it, right? So what happened was, remember, Adam and Eve were not created in a factory, they weren't created in a seminary. They were created in a garden called Eden. You know what the word Eden means in the Hebrew? Party, bliss. And they were created in this garden. And mind you, the garden was just a small part of the world. And he says, I'm going to create you in this garden of bliss where you have this encounter, this, this dance that you're in the middle of. And man, you're going to get to experience that. And we're with you. We have fellowship. And what I want you to do is I want you to subdue, multiply, and enforce, and do all these things to the end of the world so that this image that you find here in innocence is sent everywhere else, the kingdom. One job. But they mess up. And they mess up and... That dance, that fellowship is disrupted. And it says this. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took the fruit off the tree and ate it. She also gave it to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. So they had this fellowship. They were having fun with the Father every day, walking in the cool of the day, the cool of the night, enjoying this fellowship that the Trinity had. Now it was a party for five. And then they go against God's will and eat something, and their eyes are opened. But open to what? Another dance. Yeah. Another conclusion. Another belief system. Another party. And so their eyes were open. They knew that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves on and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of God walking in the garden of the cool of the day. In the Hebrew, it means that God showed up. The Ruach, the same breath that hovered over creation, given an identity, showed up to remind them who they were. And he shows up, the Ruach, right? The breath of God. And Adam and his, and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees in the garden. Then the Lord called out to Adam and said to him, Where are are you? You know, it's funny because in our English translation, that's a question. Where are you? But God knew where they were. But in the Hebrew, it says, 
It translates more effectively to man's nowhere. The man that I knew inside the dance, I see you, Adam and Eve, but that person who celebrated the dance with me is no longer here. Man is not here. That's what it translates to in the Hebrew. So God walks in, and they, he's showing up for fellowship because he's not afraid of sin. And he walks in, ready to do fellowship, and he says, God, he says, guys, where are you? But he doesn't say, God, where are you? He says, Adam and Eve, I see you hiding in fig leaves, and you have a false covering. But you're not the same as when you were in our dance. And ever since then, Adam and Eve created a different dance. They dropped their own disco ball. They had their own DJ. They had their own party favors. And they knew that anything in that party wouldn't be anything like the one they already had. <laughs> Adam, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked. And I hid myself. Next. See, the broad way that leads to destruction is self-righteousness, a do-it-yourself system. You see, Adam and Eve already had that. They had the dance. They had that relationship. And the devil says that if you do it yourself, you can get something with, that you're already included in. You see, the very first temptation in the garden was to do it yourself. If you want to be like God, they already were. Do it yourself. Eat of this tree and you'll be just like it. And Jesus comes and one of the last things he does on the cross is he hangs on there. And with Adam, the very first temptation that came from the first Adam ends with the last Adam. Do it yourself. If you want to be like God, eat this tree and you'll be just like him. Just do it yourself, Adam. And then God and God himself, Jesus, is on the cross and the guy next to him, or the, the guys are mocking him and said, hey, if you want to just get down, you can do it yourself. And Jesus goes, no. That whole do-it-yourself system, that born and cursed humanity has to come to an end. I could get down myself, but that do-it-yourself, that broad way of destruction ends now. I can't get down. That's what got me here. So lovingly, he endured the cross, died your death, rose for you, seated you in heavenly places so you can dance. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is boring. Next. The last Adam lost the rhythm. I mean, the first Adam lost the rhythm, but the last Adam restores the dance. Next. When you were the legend, you will never be good enough. When he's the legend, you are already good enough. You see, if it's based on your works, you'll always be fighting for breakthrough and victory the rest of your life. But if you put it on his work, your life begins with victory. You start at the finish line. Next. I'll just end with this real quick. Ben, can I get you up on some finger plucking? He says this on uh, John chapter 14. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. Jesus is about to leave. And he makes this interesting statement. He says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. You know, if we're not careful, when we put it based on works, the church is very arrogant about that statement. And they go to people in restaurants and say, ha ha, Jesus is the only way. And if you want to be like us, you got to do this, this, and this, and this, and this. But Jesus is the only way. And he is the only way. But do you know why he's the only way? What is he the way to? You see, he's the way back to the dance. And the reason why he's the only way is because before you were even thought of, before you had the ability to sin or try to make up for it, he was there. And he's coming to humanity and says, I've always been in this fellowship with the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And we long for humanity to be inside of here again. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and die your death, present you righteous, make you compatible so you can be sitting right here in this dance. And I'm the only way because I'm the only one who's been there. I'm inviting you to a fellowship, but not just a fellowship you can create and add coloring to make it better. The original fellowship that existed. You see, there's only one life cycle. There's only one life cycle in the existence, and it started in the Trinity. And if you're not there, you're living a pseudo one. 
And you have to manufacture and buy different lights and change the music every six months and go to a different venue. And ultimately, it's only frustrating because you know deep down you belong somewhere else. You are here. Next. So I'm going to read this out of the mirror translation. It's uh, John 14, but I'm going to read 1 through 6, where he says, I am the way, the life, and the truth. And this really brings it to life. He says, set your troubled hearts at ease by letting your belief conclude in God as you rest in your confidence in what Jesus has done. What makes the Father's house home is your place in it. What makes God's place dance, what makes God's thing dance is he knows your place in it. And to be any other way, any, any other place else is the way to destruction. No matter how much you've medicated it, no matter how much painkillers or alcohol you want to do, when you sober up, you still find yourself outside of that place. What makes my father's house home is your place in it. He's talking to everybody today. That his house is not complete. That the father hurts for you by not being in this dance. If this was not the ultimate conclusion of my mission, why would I even bother to do what I'm about to do if it was not to prepare a place that was already yours? I have come to persuade you one assignment on earth as a convincer, the persuader of what God believes about you is righteousness. I prepare a place for you. I've come to you to persuade you of a place of seamless oneness where you belong. Jesus was not about to, be, to become a building contractor in heaven. He's not in the mansion building business as some translations will imply. He's standing on the threshold of the cross in his death and resurrection that he would prepare a place for us of restoration, intimate oneness with himself, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit and truth. Now we may be where he is wrapped up in the same inseparable union. You see, any other way creates legends. And there can only be one legend that you subscribe to, and his name is Jesus today. And then he says this, the proportions, Jesus is saying, because he knows what he's about to accomplish for you. He knows your inheritance in the dance. He says this, the proportions of what I will accomplish are astonishing. If you just let me reveal it to you, I will prepare a highway for you, just as the oriental custom where people would go before a king to a level of the roads to make it possible for royalty to journey with ease and comfort. Then I will personally come and escort you on this royal highway, guiding you to be where I am in seamless face-to-face -face oneness with the Father's embrace. By fully identifying myself, with, identifying myself with you, I have married you in me so that you may be completely at home where I am. In fact, you have always known this way and where all this is leading me and where I am taking you. Then Thomas said, no, we don't get it. We have no idea where you're going with this. How could we possibly have known the way? And Jesus said, so he says, I am the way. But he says, my I amness is mirrored in you is your way. This is the truth and this is also your life. Every single person now is brought face to face with the Father entirely by my doing. So let's just take communion real quick. Let's pass these out. Thank you. So in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is bringing things back into focus. And he's trying to communicate to us that his way is the only way. And his invitation to everybody today as we take communion is that we don't be distracted by the Broadway. 
that leads to destruction. He's communicating that Jesus is the centrality of why we belong to this cosmic dance. And everything that's in him is in you. So let's just stand up real quick before we take communion. don't take this out of religious obligation or because he said do it in remembrance of me we do it because the devil tries to distract you from where you really are and he tries to give you works to get there and then he convinces you to tell people to join that party pooping so here we go let's take the bread and we thank you lord for your goodness and your kindness and your mercy that endures forever, Lord. We thank you uh, for the conclusion you have for us and by us. Thank you for being the way, God. In Jesus' name, amen. And then we take the blood that reminds us that we can't bring our party into his. <laughs> that it had to be the blood of the lamb, God's lamb, not ours. That could set us free and put us back in this dance and this intimacy. So we bless you, God. And we thank you in the name of Jesus. And we drink it. Amen, amen. Hey, guys, thanks for coming out and hanging out. I know we went a little bit late today. Thank you for coming. Stick around, man. Have some conversation. Have some coffee. Ask some questions. We'll see you next week. Amen.